Shavnam Diaries Podcast Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna everyone! Okay, mic is there, everything, you should not touch the mic. Hare Krishna! So, today we are... Welcome everyone to Saturday Q&A and today we are having a follow-up episode with the last week with the Naman X Patel who was kind of... Um, uh, asking follow-up questions to the discussed topic of uh, last week so um, and he was very polite and very humble and cultured and in the way that he questioned us in the sense that you know is this like did he understand us correctly or like is this proper understanding and I really appreciated and admired it because this kind of like unfolds the question even further and we're going to go deeper into the topic of dharma and uh, i really like the direction that it's going so uh, stay tuned (laughs) and we're starting so first of all in order to follow and fulfill uh, my dharma i must follow yuga dharma right Uh, yeah i have it here (laughs) Uh, he specified what does it mean like if he understood it correctly that i told he asked me what is my dharma and i told him yuga dharma is your dharma and he's like did i understand it correctly that all I need to do is chant holy name and I'm saying yes yes you understood it correctly because in Kali Yuga the Yuga Dharma it unfolds you know just like a lotus it just like if you open it if it opens up that lotus if it opens up then uh, just you will see the whole beauty and so there may be like a million petals of that lotus that's like uh, Galoka Vrindavan you know like it says that Galoka Vrindavan is in the shape of a lotus so and similarly, if you're opening up, if you're chanting the holy name, of course, I suggest you, when I say that you should follow Yuga Dharma and chant the holy name, I don't just mean you buy the beads and then you just chant, 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 and then wait for moksha, <laughs> right? I'm not saying that. I'm telling you to chant the holy name. Uh, and uh, I'm telling you to, of course, approach nearby center where you can also get trained up in order to receive initiation, in order to chant the holy name, meaning uh, the mantra in order to, for the mantra fall, fala, mantra fala, right? The fruit of the mantra in order to achieve that. You have to receive it in the chain of disciplic succession. So uh, it's best to receive the mantra from the guru. So that means you have to take initiation within Brahma, Madhava, Gaudiya, Sampradaya. That's how it works. And of course, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, there is a verse which says that Hare Krishna Maha Mantra does not, does not require initiation. It does not. It, it's right there in Chaitanya Charitamrita. But understanding your further questions, I can see that you have um, inclination to preach because like, we'll go there. So if you want to preach, if you're not Bhajan Anandi, if you're a Goshti Anandi and you want to preach, that means you have to take initiation, that means you may even take second initiation, meaning Brahminical initiation, in order to preach, in order to actually function within uh, Brahminical culture and uh, establish uh, spiritual culture in this society. So yeah, in that sense, you should get initiation and you should chant the holy name. That's what I mean by saying Yuga Dharma is your Dharma. And it's the only way to attain moksha. I mean, of course, um, uh, when Sarabhama Bhattacharya, he said like, um, moksha, and what was that? Atat kampam sasamikshama no vajane vatna hitam vetalam hridvagla pubhir hitam namaste Moksha, right, the, he kind of like striked out the word moksha and said bhakti pade, not moksha. But Lord Chaitanya said um, like prema, bhakti and moksha for devotees is the same thing. So yeah, I'm saying that the only way to attain mukti in the age of Kali is by chanting the holy name. The only way to attain prema bhakti, which is like woo, that level, <laughs> it's much more tasty. Mm, like infinitely more tasty than moksha yeah this is the way as they say 
So uh, Varna is based on karma, nature, and not lineage and caste, is it? Not necessarily. <laughs> no. I didn't mean to say that Varna is not based on lineage at all, right? Just like sometimes you plant brinjal and brinjal comes out, right? Sometimes you plant um, carrots and the carrots come out. So I've seen many devotees in ISKCON who are born in Brahmin families and they're, they're acting Brahminical, like they're uh, fulfilling their Brahminical duties within uh, ISKCON, meaning they're teachers. And uh, that's what they do. I mean, they also do something like administrative also on the side. But of course, like within, because like, see, if you're talking about um, uh, what I mentioned about Varnas, and if we're going deeper into that topic, let's establish this. First of all, let's establish the fact that uh, a Vaishnava is above Varnas and definitions. Meaning, I would say, uh, last episode I mentioned that always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. That's your Dharma and Adharma, right? So basically I said become a Vaishnava, right? So, uh, and uh, you will be amazed, I suggest you personally to read Chaitanya Bhagavata with the commentaries of His Holiness uh, Shri, um, how do I, how do you say it officially? I mean, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. In the verse which he, where he glorifies uh, Murari Gupta, he says that basically you will go to hell if you try to fit a Vaishnava into some kind of Varna. You'll go to hell for that because Murari Gupta he cured the disease material and the disease that uh, uh, was keeping us from being Vaishnavas. Like it, it's it's a beautiful purport. I've read it like hundred like hundred times ago, hundred years ago. Um, I've read it such a long time ago with my Guru Maharaj when he was reading Chaitanya Bhagavata during pandemic. But it just struck me that you know we were not supposed to judge devotees by Varna, even if they're acting within one. We're devotees above everything, but yeah, just as an etiquette, social kind of interaction, we do that. So no, I would say that uh, varna, uh, karma is based on uh, varna is based on karma, nature, not lineage, caste. It's you have to take into consideration these are factors. It's like you're saying that weather is based on wind. Temperature, sun, planet, moon, um, clouds, or you know, it's like all of these different factors have to be taken into consideration. You have to take into consideration guna karma, guna also. If somebody is supposedly a genius lying in a pool of garbage, you can't say he's a Brahmin, right? That, not technically like not strictly speaking because brahmins they're very pure and very clean that actually will bring us to the next topic but let's not go ahead of ourselves so guna karma has to be taken into consideration guna and karma next lineage you can take it into considerations like for example uh speaking about me right my uh, grandfather he was my my dada right my dad was a movie, um, how do you call it, director, movie director. And my daddy, she was a movie editor. Now, my nana, he was a priest, he was a mullah. And my nani, she was a nurse. So, technically speaking, all those professions are brahminical. Like, even yesterday I was uh, listening to the class of Jagadish Prabhu and Jugula Priti Mataji. And they were saying that in Natya Shastra is described that the script writer and the director of dramas, it's supposed to be a Brahmin. I was like, wow, my dad actually, he's a script writer. He is <coughs> educated in Vgik, Vsirasiski uh, Gosudarsny Institut Kinematography. Those who know Russians, they will understand. Like I always proud of the fact that my dad he because it was Soviet Union, education was free. So he could study, even though he was from Tajikistan, he studied at the best, topmost university of cinematography in Soviet Union as a script writer. So my dad is a script writer and my mom, she's a teacher. So you can say two plus two is one. Yeah, two plus two is one. Did I just say two plus two is five? <laughs> oh my God. 
I'm saying that 2 plus 2 is 4. Um, I was going into spiritual mathematics, don't judge me. Spiritual mathematics, 1 plus 1 equals 1, okay? 2 plus 2 is 1, oh my god, I said, and, I'm, and I can't even edit this video. God, goodness gracious, my math teachers would kill me. Hare Krishna. Well, well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> And I wanted to become an astrologer. <laughs> That's funny. Anyhow, so you can say that uh, uh, 2 plus 2 is 4. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes 2 plus 2 is 1. <laughs> and you have Brahma Bandhus. Brahma Bandhus are those who are born in Brahmin families, but they're not really Brahmins. So anyway, you got it, right? Thanks. So that's, uh, that's what Varna is based on. And if, again, coming back to Yuga Dharma, right? That if you will take Yuga Dharma very, very strategically to the heart and seriously, you will get first initiation, then you will get second initiation. And when you get second initiation, that will be your Brahmin initiation. And, you know, in spite of whatever is it that you're involved uh, to make money, to put the food on the table, you will still have your Brahmin thread and you have to follow Brahminical culture and uh, uplift the society in that way by worshipping the deities, uh, being a counselor, a teacher, and so forth and so on. Next, uh, mental torture due to others, people's lifestyle and surroundings. Where does Dharma fit? And that's exactly where I told you just uh, a couple of uh, minutes ago. That's where Dharma fits. We need to preach. Goshtya Nandis are those who preach. If you don't educate people about it, they don't know about it. And that's where actually, um, you remember in Bhagavad Gita, there is a four kinds of demoniac persons described. And it's described there that there are demonic persons, the Radhamas, who know exactly what to do, but they don't do it. So I considered myself, I'm not an Indian, but uh, I grew up in a devotional family, meaning my parents were devotees before I was made. So, and um, I was born in ISKCON, let's just say, and I knew everything about ISKCON and all the, you know, you have to chant 16 rounds and everything. But uh, I remember when I was like 13 or 14, I was not really like very much serious about my spiritual life. I wouldn't chant 16 rounds. And later on, I was thinking that, wow, I knew that chanting 16 rounds is very, very important, but I wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. So, and later on, it actually, why I'm explaining this to you is that sometimes it doesn't only come to chanting. Other things in life also fit into that category. We know exactly what to do and we don't do it. And that makes us Naradamas, right? So what makes us rise from that platform is receiving spiritual education. Because just by knowing something, superficially it doesn't make us actually practice it deeply on a deeper level and that's why we need to educate ourselves with Srila Prabhupada's books where the Krishna book I will take Krishna book do you know how much how much knowledge and how much um, depth spiritual taste you can get just by reading Krishna book this is in Russian by the way this is Russian book uh, Russian Krishna book and uh, I have one of them I have signed one of them I have signed from one very awesome uh, his um, I forgot his sannyasa name his um, brahmachari name was Achala Prabhu awesome devotee he signed it for me so yeah reach La Prabhupada's books educate yourself education doesn't mean that somebody comes and like bay like a mother bird she feeds us and you were like ah give me education and it has to like drop into our mouth otherwise no education we can't educate ourselves oh my you know what it's time for us to take a responsibility for our own lives and i just just take the book i has to say the worst um the worst the most uh, difficult thing about yoga hatha yoga is to sit on the mat isn't it so the most difficult part about studying proper books is picking it up from the bookshelf and opening it up 
and this is the most difficult part like you know this is the hand it just doesn't go there. <laughs> but no actually if you go and just like um, we have this now um, I will see if uh, we will have some time to cover that question but maybe we'll cover it next week because it's also a big topic there's one a subscriber of ours his name is the weird one he asked us about how to read Bhagavad Gita, what are the rules about reading Bhagavad Gita, etc. And you know, and this is also one of the topics, you know, like, like he was saying that his uh, in, uh, parents are inspiring him a lot to read, but he himself he's still uh, only beginning to. So yes, like this is us. We have these books on our bookshelves, laid in dust. The only service we do to Prabhupada's books is just. Well, like you know clearing all of the dust is this education is this like <laughs> this is where yuga dharma comes in yuga dharma doesn't just mean i chant Hare krishna and i have no idea what this what is krishna who is krishna where does he live what is his personality what does he want from me and this and that and now also another thing that i really interesting that naman x patel asked us he said how does krishna allow people eating meat like beef and everything like that how does krishna allow well krishna doesn't allow can you believe that? Krishna doesn't allow. In fact, Krishna would kill such people. But Krishna is not there right now. There is Paramatma and Paramatma allows. Paramatma is like, okay, whatever you want. We turned away from Krishna. We don't look at Krishna. We turned away and we came to this material world. And Krishna came along with us and he's sitting there in our hearts. He's sitting there and Yamaraj is also sitting there. Yamaraj is like, he's going to hell. He's eating beef. He's going to hell, he's going to this kind of hell, he's going to that kind of hell. Paramatma is like, yeah, what to do? He, that's what he wants, you know? And that's actually, actually exactly that, um, you know, we turned away from Krishna. And Krishna is like, we told him that actually it's described in Bhagavad Gita that Krishna is the source of different types of consciousness within us. Imagine. You turn, you turn towards Krishna and you're like, Krishna, I want to forget about you and do everything that makes you mad, that makes you upset, everything that hurts you. You're go Brahma Nahitaya Chaya, you protect cows, I want to eat the cows. We tell that to Krishna and Krishna is like, okay. Then he goes away. He goes away. And then he comes as a four-armed Paramatma. He's like, what else do you want? And you imagine all of these materialists who do all of these sinful activities, their desires are fulfilled. They make these desire maps, meditate on what the universe can give them. And Krishna gives them everything because he's been there since time immemorial. And he knows that we're just stupid. We're his children, but we're just stupid. So that's why we do stupid things that make us go to hell over and over and over and over again. Samsara cycle again and again. So yeah, it's mental torture for you. You think that's not mental torture for me? I'm not going out of India. I don't want to go out of India. The first time I went out of India, like I came to India in 2008. Then in 2013, I was supposed to go back to Russia to renew my visa. And my first experience, I was so scared. I was like, oh my God, I'm going out of India. I was like, Namaste Narasim Haya, Samsara Dava, Nalalidha Loka in the, in the airplane. I was like, Krishna Chaitanya, this is so scary. Like, you know, this, uh, I don't want to go into Maya, all of this. And, and the, of course, the first thing I get, we arrive to Astana in Kazakhstan, and this air hostess, a man air hostess, he's, he screams at me. Air host, right? He screams at me because my dad is like, isn't it that our meals, like vegetarian meals, were supposed to be included or something? They have to give us some snacks. Can you find out? And I went and I'm like, do we get some snacks or... And he's like, he screamed. He literally screamed at me. And I'm like, where is my Bharat? Where is my Bharat Varsha? <laughs> where people are nice. You know? Yeah. So how does, how can Krishna, like Krishna doesn't let that happen. Paramatma lets that happen because this is our freaking desire. We want to go to hell, basically. It's just like, uh, we want to go to hell with extra steps. That's all. Okay, so this is basically like the sum up of everything that I wanted to say. And since we are 19 minutes in, I think we can address uh, the, um, the question of the weird uh, one uh, subscriber who asked how to read Bhagavad Gita 
and uh, actually it leads us to the topic which also connected to the question of Naman ex Patel because uh, he says that, you know, okay, I may not like all of the surrounding and lifestyle, materialistic lifestyle, but what to do if I'm in one? And that's exactly where you have to become the biggest, the bigger person. You have to become a preacher. That's exactly where you have to follow in the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. I would highly recommend you read about them. Read Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita, read Bhaktisiddhanta Vaibhava of Bhaktivikash Maharaj and study their personality, get inspiration from how they were able to preach. Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was ready to serve meat to the high government officials just so they would be able to um, rename a certain street over here in Mayapur so that uh, birthplace of Lord Chaitanya would be officially Yoga Pit right here where it is meant to be. Bhaktisiddhan Saraswati Thakur, he was ready to go for such a sacrifice. Are we willing to sacrifice that for the mission? Understanding that yes, it's, it's moochy, it's like, it's horrible but it's not about me it's about my spiritual master just like Srila Prabhupada he if you read um, miracle on second avenue it's a miracle it's literally a miracle that Srila Prabhupada stayed in America and he preached and he he went through all of that patiently with such level of tolerance such level of humility he didn't give up he stayed there and you know you will cry your heart will be broken but you know you you follow the Mahajanas because this is exactly where that verse of um, Mahabharata comes into the picture that you know dharma dharma is very difficult to actually find out what is what but if you follow Mahajanas if you follow Srila Prabhupada if you follow Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur even if you follow like look at all of our present uh, Guru Acharyas of ISKCON you look at how they how they are able to preach you but I would say that first of all uh, have your shining light of Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur that's my personal recommendation because they are, they are Nitya Siddhas they are just like the shining light and actually like uh, great acharyas of our present day, like His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami Maharaj, they say, like, you know, listen to Prabhupada 99% and listen to me 1%. <laughs> yeah. So, this is where it comes to, you know, preaching, basically. It's about preaching. Going to the West, there is absolutely no difference, difference uh, between Vrindavan, which is here in India, and Vrindavan in our heart if we are able to create it. And the only reason to go out of the spiritual dham is to take that dham with you. Just like my Guru Maharaj says with the Vrindavan experience, you know. Like the only reason to leave Vrindavan is to share Vrindavan. So share that dham, share that purity with others. You are consequential. Don't think that I am so inconsequential that I will never be able to. No, you will be able to do something. And that's where you have to get training. You have to get training through Prabhupada's books. You have to get training through personal interactions with actually people who do preach. Maybe you can join Brahmacharya Ashram for a couple of years. I mean, if I would be in a man's body, I definitely would, believe me. So um, the weird one, he asked how to read uh, Bhagavad Gita. That there are basic rules, of course. It's nice if you are, you are supposed to actually worship Bhagavad Gita. You can offer incense, flowers to Bhagavad Gita. It's nice to do Achiman before you read Bhagavad Gita. Not speaking, not even speaking about like taking shower and being pure. You should not put it. Actually, last episode, I, I, I had Bhagavad Gita in my hand, and at one point I put it on my lap, and I was thinking that somebody will notice, somebody will comment, and I'm like, of course somebody did. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to put Bhagavad Gita on your lap. You're supposed to have like a special like a special table for the Bhagavad Gita and you have to be, like be very very respectful respectful and reverent like there should be reverence to Bhagavad Gita and then Bhagavad Gita is a person actually so in Brihad Bhagavatamrita there is a whole chapter which describes that in the abode of Lord Brahma there is like all of these like Bhagavad Gita, Shemad Bhagavatam, the personalities 
and they're personified Bhagavad Gita. Personification of Srimad Bhagavatam, I and mean, they can talk and they can, you know, so they're like people. So you can also treat them like people. That's how you're supposed to treat Bhagavad Gita, and in that way you should read. But mostly, most importantly, the way we worship is by reading and trying to understand sincerely. So I would say that you can worship and, and be like in great reverence, like from a very far distant place, but unless you read it, it doesn't really make sense. <laughs> so yeah, we may be ignorant and we may be uncultured, but uh, if you read Bhagavad Gita sooner or later, it will purify your heart. So it's more important that you read it again and again. And uh, you read it, you can read it alone. You can read it in a company, like two people. Uh, you can read it in a circle. Okay, how you read it in a circle? Uh, so basically, say, you take a verse. That's how we read. I mean, there's no hard and fast rules. I'm just giving you suggestions how you could read it or how I read it and how it inspired me personally. So you can read it in a circle, like one person, say, he reads one verse, one verse. And then he reads it, and then he has to say it in his own words. And then other people, they also have to repeat what they've heard. See, like, it, it goes between the ear and the mouth, right? Because many times, like, you know, if you talk about bookworms, right? Bookworms or book nerds or geeks, right? They can devour material literature. You can't devour Bhagavad Gita because it's spiritual literature. It's magic. You try and let me know, okay? Like, of course you can like pretend that you've devoured it, but it's not gonna work because it's uh, transcendental literature. So if you're sincere and submissive, like uh, you can uh, read it, then you uh, say it in your own words and then everybody in the circle, like say the circle is six people. They also read it and then you pass on the book and like that. The process feels as if it's very slow, but it's very, very efficient, meaning you remember everything. You remember every single thing. It's very awesome. Uh, uh, uh. Also, how to pronounce Krishna and Krishna. Did I bring? No, I didn't bring. Oh, yeah, I did. So, yeah, um, he says that uh, the way we pronounce Krishna is uh, not exactly Krishna and Krishna, right? So uh, the weird one, right? <laughs> the weird one. The weird one, he's saying that we are misspelling the word Krishna, right? Because is it supposed to be... Did I put the camera mirror away so that nobody will be able to read what I wrote? I'm not sure. Um, Krishna and Krishna. So basically speaking, um, we are trying to present the word Krishna through um, English alphabet. And that means transliteration, which means it will always be faulty. And thing is that, uh, just like, uh, you have to understand that thing is either we use literal transliteration of everything or we are like saying Krishna instead of Krishna and uh, and it will never be as purely pronounced as like you know like the Chinese they uh, they're saying like Krishna or something like that Russians they say Krishna Krishna and there's like Krishna and Krishna literally Krishna that's how Russians pronounce it uh, instead of Prabhupada they say Prabhupada you know like like or the Bengalis they say instead of Nama Om, they say Nama Yom Vishnu Padaya. So it's like, um, I've heard the explanation of that, that uh, of course with generations, I mean, maybe if everybody would take Sanskrit courses, <laughs> it would be sooner, but uh, basically we all need to learn how to properly pronounce Sanskrit because apparently, I mean, it's quite evident that Krishna, our Lord's name, he, it's written in Sanskrit. So it would be nice if we would learn Sanskrit and how to pronounce it properly. But we are basically meditating and praying to Lord Janardana, who is in our hearts, who is accepting our sincerity and not our proper pronunciation. But yeah, in ISKCON you will find as many countries, as many people, as many ways to pronounce the word Krishna. 
and officially you will uh, see like say if I will take is there any uh, book here which is oh okay this is oh the Nectarian Ocean of the Holy Name okay I'll take both of them I have here the Japa Reform book by Satsuru Padas Gaswami Maharaj and I have here Nectarian Ocean of the Holy Name by um, His Holiness Shachinandana Swami Maharaj right so here Shachinandana Maharaj there was one yeah right here he is t telling us how to properly pronounce see like there's a whole guidance on proper pronunciation of the mantra and meter Hare Krishna Krishna and yes so and there's also another book by Lokanath Maharaj Lokanath Swami Maharaj he's also on how to pronounce Sanskrit words because you know like we're like Americanizing it instead of saying prasadam we say prashadam prashadam because that's how Americans say we are very young and we are learning so and this is Japa no the Japa reform book Maharaj doesn't he doesn't yeah it's more about internal by the way highly recommend it it's about internal I really like for by the way from this book since we're holding it in our hands um, it's written there that sometimes when you chant Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and your mind is very very loud and saying something so you can imagine that you know for those people who work on sound or sound engineers or uh, soundtrack masters any video bloggers also you have this soundtrack right so imagine that the soundtrack that you of your mind it's going there and you can't make it nah, you can't make it low or you can't delete it so then you just take the second track of the maha mantra and then you just make it louder <laughs> even though that your mind is at the back somewhere is also like making some noise your japa soundtrack it's louder and it's just overpowering it yeah so that's going to be it for today's uh, saturday q a uh, let me know what you think about it in the comments if there are any follow-up questions please um, if i um, offended anybody or if i unconsciously made anybody uncomfortable <laughs> i was very excited about today's uh, saturday q a because i really love this topic of preaching topic of varnashrama and the topic of yuga dharma and also i really appreciated the question about how to read bhagavad gita properly and i will try to also um, apply it in my uh, personal life that uh, you know to also be more um, have more reverence and more respect towards your prophet's books and Vedic literature and also keep them <laughs> closer to my heart so yes so uh, Hare Krishna see you next week and looking forward to your comments and uh, questions Hare Krishna Thank you so much for tuning in today. The book links, previous episodes, timeline, and biography of the author can be found on shravanamdiaries.com. The link is in the description, and we shall see you tomorrow. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna.